and welcome to Let's Go Speaks. Today is Thursday, May 4th. Be with you. And it's episode 196. Hi, how are you? I know, we're in a different place. It's okay. Uh, it feels, yeah, you're super observant. We are in a different place than normal. We will not be here permanently, but we may be back and forth a little bit for a while. So just be prepared. It's still me. Can't kind of mistake that. But the background might change. We're actually in my kitchen today because there's craziness. There's too many humans in the house. Notice that I said it was a Thursday? Whatever. <laughs> so anyway, we're here. And it's really super dark and dreary outside. So hopefully in the future it will be slightly brighter in this place, uh, but for now it's a little bit gray. I've been seeing on Instagram when some people are like, it's 100 degrees here! And I'm like, dude, it's like 50 and it will never stop raining here. My kid was supposed to go to a baseball game today with her school, and she was so pumped about it, and I was like... <laughs> I don't feel too bad, I mean, like, I, I, would, I wish she'd go. But it didn't occur to me that when she was getting ready, that like she has no waterproof shoe items and they were gonna be outside like in the rain because this is like a minor league baseball team with all open stuff and they're gonna be walking I'm sure quite I'm not the process probably actually do drop them off close so never mind that but she's outgrown all of her range sh waterproofy kind of shoes <sighs> so she totally wore do you remember that episode where my, I got my foot stuck in the shoe? Well, I didn't really get my foot stuck in the shoe on the episode. I just told you about it on the episode. Do you remember that? If you don't, it's fine. But for those of you who don't remember, I bought a pair of Croc rain boots, and I'm not generally a fan of Crocs. I actually don't like that whole, like, my feet just are too hot to wear those things. But uh, for rain boots, they totally worked for me. And I put the, tried them on without a sock on, and then my foot got like vacuum locked in there, and I couldn't get it out. Okay, so those shoes, she totally wore those shoes. <laughs> and while she's a size 10 and I'm a size 11, and really if you're a sock knitter, there's not that much difference in length between those two sizes. Like, she's like a 10 year old, and her feet are like this wide. She's wearing my giant fat lady rain boots. Also, I'm standing, so there may be more of this today. I don't know. There probably will be. <laughs> Meh. Did I even mention, hi, I'm the Fat Squirrel. My human name is Amy Beth, but my Ravelry name is the Fat Squirrel. And my Instagram name, to further complicate things, is the Fat S-Q-R-R-L. That's where you can find me, though. Please do so. I think that's like the basics, right? So this week's episode will contain from the boards. It will contain shenanigans. It will contain knitting, no spinning, and it will contain shameless promotion. Cause Mother's Day is coming up, yo. Or like what I like to call it, Lady Day. Yay, ladies! Cause there's no general Lady Day, so sometimes you gotta muscle in on Mother's Day. So, <laughs> shenanigans. We'll do it right now, because I'm in the room that the shenanigans occurred in. Do you remember how I said I was in my kitchen? Okay, my house was built, we think, in the 20s, 1920s. Um, not by fancy people. <laughs> The house that's right next to us, that we think was built at the same time, has like beautiful, um, is it par parquet, right? The wood floors that are all beautifully designed. It has beautiful floor. Now upstairs they just have subfloor like we do. But in our house, no such luck. <laughs> wood subfloor all the way. But in the kitchen, the, the ex, the, okay, the layers of floor are as such subfloor, 1930s linoleum, 1960s, 70s linoleum, 
Actually, between those two things, there's about 35 inches of pain and sorrow, but we'll get to that in a minute. And then, 1990s peel and stick. Do you remember when those like redoing health shows were like a huge thing in the late 90s? Maybe even the early 2000s? What were those like when they would, what was that show called? Do you remember? Like they would like redo a house in your room and you would have like no input on it but like people in your family or something would like nominate this house, this room to be redone. Oh no, that's right. It was unprepared. There were two families and like they decorated the other one's rooms but they didn't really decorate they just provided the labor essentially and maybe this much input and then the designer would um design everything and they would always just peel and stick floors and the whole time would be like don't do this to those people leave them with a cruddy floor at least they want to pick up a cruddy floor to get to the old cruddy floor well this floor was all cruddy it's fine it's a floor it totally keeps out the damp you can wipe up the damp. Functional. A little bit. <laughs> but of course the problem with peel and stick if you've never had it, lucky you. But what happens is it's like plate it's like a lesson in plate tectonics. Like these floors are they they just like a it's basically like a sticker and you stick it on the floor. Well it's these squares, and so as as the plates shift, they go up over each other and make these mountains. And then where they pull away from the other guy, there's a rift, and then like it, but the bad thing is like where there's the mountain and the rift, there's like exposed glue. And so every piece of dirt that lives in the universe adheres to said glue and your floor always looks dirty no matter how hard you try to make it not look dirty. Now see, I don't need it to look impeccable, but it would also not like <laughs> to look like there was like dirty chewing gum stuck to it. You know what I mean? Some mid ground. I'm in ground with that floor. So anyway, this weekend, I lit so many fires under so many butts. Okay, really just two. Well, mine too, three. I lit the fires under those three butts and we totally took up the floors. Our kitchen is super small, by the way. I mean, it's not super small. It's not like one of those gallery, galley kitchens. It's actually like a quarter of the bottom floor of our house. So it's not like, actually not, it's not super small. It's not like McMansion big though either, you know what I mean? So it's not like it's a huge surface area to work with. I could tell you measurements, but I'm not that prepared as we discussed. So it's not like a huge task. Well, okay. So here's like our perceptions of it. My partner who's lived in this house for, I moved into this house 12 years ago. So he's lived in this house longer than that. He has wanted to change the floor for approximately 14 to 15 years, but has felt like the task was just too insurmountable. My husband's a very hard worker, like fit, strong upper body, like, so he felt like it was very daunting and overwhelming. I knew it was gonna be hard, but I felt like it, could, it was doable. And then Tova's interpretation or impression of what was gonna happen was that it was gonna take two hours. <laughs> So we had like the full spectrum of what was gonna happen. Um, she was wrong and he was wrong and I was right, surprise. Were you surprised? Of course you weren't. Anyway, so, oh my gosh though. Actually it was not, I mean it was bad. It could have been way worse though, right? Like so we, the, there's like lots of different like schools of thought about how you can make this happen. Uh, but what we ultimately did was we used a heat gun, the, the, t the peel and sticks came up without much trouble, but unfortunately this, this middle layer, this 1960s, 70s, we're not sure, blood red linoleum, by the way, blood red. And by the way, there used to be pink metal kitchen cabinets in this room. That was a look. It was a lot of look. A lot of look. Anyway. So, because basically the peel and stick, as long as you get it warm, it'll just, I mean, it doesn't come right up, but it pretty much comes right up. For example, in our mud room, the other two layers of flooring do not exist. Uh, it, the mud room was a later add-on to the house, so we don't know when that happened. It's like our mud room and laundry room. 
So it just has some sort of like weird plywood floor. Oh, that's so sketchy. Which by the way, like not even not square. It's like anti-square. It is a pol it's like a tetrahedron or something. I don't even know what is happening there. Anyway, that's not what I want. What's this one? That's not a tetrahedron. Which one is that one? It's not the parallelogram because these are not parallel. What is that one? Do you remember? I totally went to college for four years and took math all four years. There was none of that happening, but you know what I mean. But I forgot like the third grade. Anyway, moving on. So that floor is just like the peel and sticks on top of this like wood floor. So that was actually totally easy. And in fact, that took like 20 minutes. It was not hard at all. Just heat the thing with the heat gun and then push the like giant ice scraper thing that's like a hoe kind of, but with a flat blade under that it pulls them up and you pull it out and this whole thing. Of course, the bad thing is now that the sticky residue that was on those peel and sink tiles is stuck to that wood flooring. So like you can't walk on it like every again all the dirt in the universe is now adhering to it I'm not sure how that's gonna happen whatever I don't want to think about it right now when we like have to pull it up to put a new floor on it the dirt not the subfloor thing we're not going under that layer because we don't know what's there probably just like mouse corpses it's probably the only thing that's holding it up so like you can't walk on it because then your shoes stick to everything so we got like rugs down because I was like oh I'll just put like brown paper down and then it occurred to me like no because then that'll be stuck there forever we won't be able to get it up <sighs> but anyway another story so peel and stick comes up relatively easily but this and we and we wanted to leave this like 30s linoleum down because again as I just said we're not sure what's under it mice corpse that's all that there is sorry mice but we're just gonna keep it this way. <laughs> so we knew we wanted to get down to that level, but not go below it. Because also it might be asbestos. We don't know. Yes. It's actually pretty cool. It's like um, what they, like a confetti floor. So it's this like kind of creamy color with these kind of sky blue and maybe grayishy taupey flecks, but then also with like these gold flecks in it. It's weird. But on top of that, the linoleum that was actually made from the blood of the corpses underneath. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> so you would heat it up and like, like for like three square inches, it would actually come off of that sub, the nice floor underneath, and you'd be like, ah, ah, and it would immediately be like, ah, and just like the tiniest, like two atoms thick layer of the plastic part would come off and leave like the 75 feet of like glued paper underneath of it. By the way, it's not just like glued paper because it because it's also like not water soluble because some sort of plastic is still adhering to the top of it on like some sort of subatomic level so the wa I know all of you who have done this are like yeah no that's what happens I know that's what happens but it just happened so I'm still dealing with it <laughs> so like you can use a wallpaper steamer we don't have a wallpaper steamer, but we do have a steam mop, um, which may actually get hotter than a wallpaper steamer. I don't know. It probably does. Uh, but we could not use that because it made the floor that we want to keep too malleable. And so while you were trying to scrape off the papery gross stuff, the other floor would come off too. So we couldn't do that. We just were like, like laying wet towels on top of it and like letting it sit, going back and just chiseling a little bit at it, using the giant floor scraper to try to scrape off that water insoluble layer. Oh my god. It only took two days. We didn't end up doing, we also have a bathroom that's connected to these 
these rooms which was also an addition when they put on that laundry room so we didn't do that bathroom because we were afraid we have the same problem where our feet would be stuck <laughs> But, but we learned from the laundry room floor that that shouldn't be too hard to take up. Oh my gosh. If this floor were just all over the floor, I'd be like, welcome to our new floor. I love, I'm totally down with the gold flecked confetti floor. I would be into our new old floor. But unfortunately it doesn't extend. And we can't just have the sticky wooden floor there. Although again, eventually it'll, it'll adhere, so much dirt will adhere to it that it'll probably be a functional like waterproof floor. So as we're doing this and it's so much work, I was like, cause I'm in my head, we were going to do this other, the, the floor that we're going to put down sometime in the future. <laughs> By the way, we're in a kitchen that we painted like nine years ago, 10 years ago, nine years ago. The windows are still just primered and not actually painted. So, so when we get around to putting a floor on this floor, <laughs> maybe before I die. Nah. Um, we have a plan to do this. It's like, I hate to admit it, I'm kind of scared. It's kind of like the new age of peel and stick. It's this floating floor, but it does have an adhesive, but because it's not adhesed to the floor underneath, hopefully the whole plate tectonics thing won't happen. It'll just be one plate. So it won't be able to flex and create mountains and canyons and things. I'm a little bit nervous about it now. But at the same time, I'm actually kind of okay with it because if it does go horribly wrong, like we'll just be able to pull it right up. It won't be like this terrible linoleum thing. So that's what I'm going with. Yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, but so like the, the it's really it was very challenging and like it was two full days of like intense work. And when I say intense work, like I am a I clearly have some like issues that I'm trying to overcompensate for because I, I have to be, I have to work extra, extra hard. I don't know. I think it's a fat thing. I'm, I'm just going to admit it. I think it's like a fat thing. I think I have to like overcompensate because I'm lazy, right? And I'm like sedentary for being fat. So I have to like overcompensate and work extra, extra hard, but then I break myself inevitably. <laughs> So I recognize that this is a flaw about me. I am trying to work on it, but I'm not there yet. As evidenced by the fact that the Monday after we did all this work, like on the Saturday, that's when the majority of the work happened. I was all like, by the end of the day, I was like trying to scrape things. I was like, I, I like literally can't make my arm do this anymore. Like I'm like holding the scraper against my body and just pushing it. Because I can't make my arm do anything anymore. <laughs> it's just like, nope. Nope. So, the Monday... My husband's... Are you even sneaking in the kitchen? I felt like my husband was sneaking in the kitchen. Anyway. What was I saying? So the Monday after these... The Saturday and Sunday of, of toil... I came down the stairs <laughs> and I moved one leg to go down the stairs and I literally like could visualize my muscle pulling off of my bone. It was like Jillian Michaels tortured me in my sleep for like the full eight hours. I was, <laughs> I was like yelping with each step. My husband at one point is like, just turn around and go backwards. So for three days, I've had to go down the stairs backwards. I go up the stairs fine. There's like some weird, like, from all of the like bending over and the squatting. See, I'm better now. Did you say I can squat again? From all of the bending over and the squatting, this like muscle in the inside of my thigh was just like, to me, nope, we're done. Not happening. And it wasn't even like, no, we're not doing it. It was like, no, we're not doing it. Stop. It's like that. Stop. They're okay now. See, I guess. 
this clearly I should do this podcast standing up all the time there are so many of you who are like dude we're car sex stop moving I'm sorry but I can now again I can now walk down the stairs without yelping which is a good thing it's rough people rough but now we have like an exciting old floor it's pretty cool and I'm looking at the floor that's just glue and sorrow over there. <laughs> it's basic. Oh. We don't use sticky traps. Okay, we do have, like, mice just love to come in our house. I'm just going to admit it. We're not dirty people. There's never food lying around. It's just a reality. And I say this, there's not like there's, you know. But um, they're mouse, they come in. And we, we use snap traps. I'm sorry, I would never kill a mouse. Else. I'm not sorry. I would never kill a mouse outside of my house. I would never do it. But the mouse comes in the house. Sorry, kids. Snap trap. But no glue traps, no poison, because those are, the, I have issues with those. I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying I do. But now this whole back room, I, was like, <laughs> I told myself, I was like, I really hope I don't come downstairs and there's just like 17 mice stuck to my floor. <laughs> Because then we have to burn the house down. I'm done. There was a point where I was like suggesting that maybe we use a blowtorch to get that paper out. <laughs> My husband wouldn't let me. He's like so not imaginative and fun. <laughs> but maybe we should move on now. From the boards. Okay. So look, I made notes, people. Somewhere. I wanted to mention there's lots of good there's not lots of good uh, posts in the Richard Simmons thread. I talked I don't know if it was last week or the week before, I think it was last week last time uh, about the Finding Richard Simmons podcast. There's lots of really good stuff in there. Um, people's different viewpoints and like you know just what they felt about it, what their takeaway was. I would love to talk more about it, but I've got to be honest with you. I don't know how to do it in this format because it feels like I will have the last say. Does that make sense? Like there's lots of things where I'm like, oh, that's not really what I meant. Or, you know, that people are saying, reflecting on uh, specifically about like a counterpoint to what I'm saying. And I just, I'm like, oh, that's not really what I meant. Or like, well, oh, but do you think about this? So I don't know how to do that without being like, I have all the power in this conversation because I have the last word out here. It's not really power because like, who cares? You know, you should not care at all. But I don't know how to have the discussion without feeling like that. So I, I'm just like, I put my stuff out there, you put your stuff out there, it's out there. So anyway, there's lots of good information out there and it's very interesting just to see people's different viewpoints about, you know, what they took away from the situation, what they took away from him in general, but there's really, the, the larger discussion really is about like celebrity and celebrity. So, um, Oh, where did I put your name down? Okay. Ramhist, R-A-M-H-I-S-T, asks, this is from episode 194. I talked a little bit about that, the game called Fields of Green. Um, and she asks if it, or she said the parts of it reminded her of Agricola. Um, and she asked, like, if I like one or the other better, or, so just, like, very briefly, I don't, I should, guess I should have brought Agricola to show you. Agricola is, like, kind of like the grand... It's not like really granddaddy, but it's one of the frontier pioneer games of like the new game board gaming revolution, I guess you could say. Anyway, they are both farming games, but that's kind of where the similarity ends. Um, Agricola is a much richer, like it's a much, it's a much richer game. Uh, board Game Geek has its complexity rated higher than Fields of Green. Um, and it is a much longer game. For example, uh, Agricola is one to five players and ranges 30 to 150 minutes. And I would say, I don't know how you play the game in 30 minutes. Maybe I play with, t my people are indecisive. I don't know. But it's a much longer game. Whereas Fields of Green is listed as 45 minutes, which I think is, again, I just played it single player, so that's gonna play faster. Um, but it's less set up and stuff than the than the Agricola. So overall, it's a much faster game. 
Um, and it's not an, uh, a light game or a filler game per se. You could play it that way. Uh, but there is like a very puzzly aspect to it. I guess you could say that Agricola is kind of puzzly because you're trying to get the most out of your turns towards an end goal. But for some reason, um, Fields of Green feels more like a puzzly game to me because you have, you're trying to, f so Agricola is pretty much worker placement. There's a little bit of dr card draft, I mean, like for example, Board Game Geek says it's card drafting, but I would never think of it as that. I just think of it as straight up worker placement. Um, you can refute, that's fine. Uh, but Fields of Green is definitely card drafting and like tile placement because you're trying to put these things together to optimize them and so that they can all get watered and so that you can use the food and so that they're next to things that give them extra points. Um, so in that way, I guess, maybe it just feels more puzzly to me. It's more, but I mean, I guess all board games that have strategy evolved are puzzly, but just, okay. I'm just trying to work that out for myself. Um, then what else? Oh, theme-wise, yes, they're both farming, uh, agriculture-based games. Um, Agricola is like medieval-y, um, Fields of Green is like 1950s-y, um, and then Price, manufactured, su manufacturer suggested MSRP, the suggested retail price of Agricola is like 70 bucks, and Fields of Green is like 35 bucks. Uh, Fields of Green is not out yet, it's supposed to be out at the end of May, I think. Um, so you'll see it on Amazon for like $80, but that's not... That's just like somebody who looks like me who bought the Kickstarter and doesn't want it anymore and is selling it out uh, for profit. <laughs> Do I like one better than other? I mean, if I had to choose one or the other, I'd choose Agricola just because it does have uh, a much greater depth and richness. But for like a casual thing, like for example, I've never played, I don't no, I've never played Agricola by myself. I've started to and then been like, not motivated enough to do this. <laughs> but Fields of Green is lighter and you know it's much easier set up blah 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 also fields of green does not have cute meeples she said she liked the meeples so fyi actually my agricola does not have cute meeples either it's an old one but i do have caverna which has all of the crazy meeples if you don't know what meeples are i apologize that is a weird word uh they're like the little you know like when you play a board game like you say sorry you had that little like chocolate kiss with a dot on top um they're just the player pieces or like again goods that you amass but usually not usually usually when you call it a meeple it's the shape of the thing so like if and like um agricola all creatures great and small or whatever it is you get little horse shaped things little cow shaped things little sheep shaped things um but sometimes it's just like a brown disc to mean cow Sometimes a white disc to mean read. So sometimes it's just an abstract representation. But usually meeple refers to a more, it's still an abstract representation, but it's more closely evocative of the thing it represents. What am I talking about? I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay. So then I think that's all from 194. 195, um, I was talking a little bit about sewing something for myself. So Good Girl Saturday, I just wanted to mention really quickly, if you're, uh, if you need a larger size range than a lot of patterns offer. What is up with the sewing patterns always stopping at what they call an extra, extra large, but is like an extra, extra large in like a tiny person store. It's like a 45 bust and I'm like, it's just the XXL and wimp and miss, I don't know, in regular women's versus women's plus. Like a 2X in women's plus is much more generously sized than a 2X in regular women's sizing. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh. But anyway, I just have to learn, I just have to learn how to like make, there's lots of patterns that's easy to make bigger, but like, I don't know, this is a bus start thing for now. I gotta figure that out, but that's just me. But anyway, going back, she suggested looking at Tina Givens, G-I-V-E-N-S, uh, because she has a bigger size range. It's just simple garments that she says she, the girl, good girl Saturday has enjoyed making. So just putting that out there into the universe. Um, Gizmo 098, because I was talking about the eye cord on my dotted raised speckled fade. 
she mentioned too, you can look at her post for better, for more explicit directions. Uh, but she was talking about a faux eye cord that she started using that is stretchier because it's, it is a faux eye cord. Instead of knitting every other row like you would in a normal eye cord, so you're knitting one row and then slipping the other row, it is a garter stitch for the outside first stitch and stockinette for the first two insides. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And she said that that has a little bit more flexibility to it. Makes sense because you're knitting every row or you're working every row instead of slipping half of them. Um, but she said it has a very similar look to a traditional eye cord after it's blocked and everything. So again, that outside row you're working in garter, outside stitch you're working in garter, and then the next, the t interior two stitches on either side would be in stock in it. So thanks, Gizmo98. And then Spinnin' Lady mentioned that Arnie and Carlos totally have their field guide at birds out. Did you know that? I haven't bought it yet because I'll be honest with you, I'm not super in love with all the Arnie and Carlos books. I love them as humans. And so I have supported them by purchasing some of their books, but I don't know if I, I'm gonna, I think this one's the library one. So I have a request from the library for it. But the birds are wicked cute. I think that's all the from the board stuff. Let's let's talk about knitting and spinning. <laughs> I have to get this because I wrote the pattern names on here. Oh my gosh. Okay. So finishing. Let's show you this because it's nicer. I finished my socks. So I don't know if you remember last time I was doing some dreaming color squishy, right? Or smushy? It's smushy. It's smushy, right? It's just 100% merino. It's not everlasting, but it's 100% merino fingering weight. It's a floor ply. And this is based on the syncopation pattern by Mary Hennings, which is a free pattern on Ravelry. Um, and basically it's just a three by one rib for six rows. And then the next six rows is, is offset by 50%. And the only reason I say that is because the pattern is actually written toe up for size men's 13. And it's explicitly written. Like it tells you row one, you do this. Row two, you do this. Zip, 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 zip. Row 95, you do this. So it's so it, it feels very overwhelming, but really all it is is a sock with that flavor put on it. So again, it's just three by one rib for six rows. And then you offset it and do three by one for six rows. And then you go back to the original. Okay, that's all it is. So this is Dreaming Color Smushy in the Aqua Jet colorway, I think. They turned out really cute. I like them. I liked this pattern though because it's very basic. It looks really pretty when they're not blocked out. So while you're working on it, because let's face it, it's a lot about you. <laughs> about the person you're giving to him, but also some, somewhat about you. Um, so anyway, so that was just enough to like, I usually am not a fan of ribbing for a whole sock, but the three by one was enough to make it interesting didn't feel like I was purling too much. And then of course it's very easy to count the sections. Like So after you work the first sock, it's very easy to be like, okay, I need to work seven of these on the next sock. Rather than what I normally do is like check it every third row. In my head I'm checking it every like 19th row, but that's why I said it's every third. So I'm moving a lot back and forth. So you might be hearing me more than normal, like my breathing. like standing up though and doing it. It's kind of fun. It feels jazzy. I like it. Okay, so then the next finished object I have to show you is on my foot. Rhymes with Marie. Blah, blah, blah. Rhymes with Maria, who is Malia, um, had a podcast, which if you've never watched, you should go watch. It's no longer in production. But it's an awesome podcast. It was very well considered, uh, great information, very informative. And so even though it's not still going on, I admit, I'm going to get pushback. I admit that I have never watched, what is that stupid show's name? It's not a stupid show. But now I can't think of it. I, that's my immediate thing. What is that show? 
It's a sci-fi show that everybody loves with the Jane hat and it only lasted for like a minute and a half. Anyway, I refuse to watch it because I know I'm just going to get invested and then like it's going to end. So, but don't feel like that about Malia's Gone <laughs> Which by the way, I can't even think the name of right now. Maybe I'll remember to put it in the show notes. Oh, I might not. Feel free to add it to the board if I forget, please. To the, the Ravelry board about this episode. <sighs> that was wildly unhelpful for you. Here's the podcast I can't remember the name of. And it's like, don't feel like this other show that I can't remember the name of. Just watch it anyway. So. But, so these are, both of these things are totally dirty. Deal with it. Um, she made me these slippers when we went to um, Paula's retreat, the Knitting Pipeline retreat, and I loved them. They're worst weight slippers, by the way. Can you check out the tiniest pom-pom in the world? It's so cute. So they're so cute. They are called the Saki slippers, S-A-K-I. And they are by Nell, N-E-L-L, Knits, K-N-I-T-S. I know people spell things weird. I know I spell Knits, but sometimes they spell with a Z. Just telling you. So I have enjoyed them so much I had to make another pair because I might want to wash them eventually. Or not, whatever. <gasps> I have to bang down again. Just look at the curtain. Okay. So I made a new pair. So now these are with... Um, I'm pretty sure, I have no idea what this yarn is, but I'm pretty sure it was like a superwash worsted weight. This is made with peace fleece. <clears throat> By the way, I really, maybe I'll show them to you on my feet. Like maybe I'll put that in. So here's my little feet in my little slippers. Aren't they cute? So cute. And also here's my crazy floor. It's looking darker, but, and by the way, that's still some glue. There's still some paper. Don't judge me. Okay, judge me. It's fine. We're working on the paper. There's just a little tiny bit left. But like, I wish you could see the gold. Can you see the gold? You can see right there. Shut up, Did right? I, do it? I don't know. But, um, they're really cute on my giantly wide feet. I know there's something about them. They just like, just make your feet seem like fun and like that. Like little mouse feet. Anyway, so this is made with peace fleece. So the pattern is written for worsted. Uh, peace fleece is list usually listed as an Aran. Um, this is the, it's something about sea moss. I don't remember what colorway it is though. But I've made like a pair of mitts out of this and a pair of, uh, of these slippers now and I still have more left. So it does not take much and I'm a size 10. Um, but anyway, so what I was trying to get at was I actually made a size medium because my gauge was off instead of a large so um but it was very easy to do i just knit the, the top a little bit longer uh than was written in the pattern so but they were very fun to make they don't take very long it's not like where you're making the felted slippers you have to make a double sole which means of course they won't last as long as a double sole but quite frankly they were so pleasant to make that i don't mind i could totally just make another pair so anyway they were fun and they are perfect, especially for this time of year. Um, our floors are still stay pretty cold for a while. So even when it's relatively like 70 degrees outside at night, my feet are cold. So I, I'm like wearing my short pants and like, so I can totally wear socks with those. But I'll just be honest with you, I don't ever want to get them out. So I just keep these in my little like side table-y thing next to my chair at night. And I can put them on. It's perfect. And they're very cute. So yay those! So again, that's the Saki S-A-K-I slipper by Nell Knits. Okay, then that's all the finished objects. Oh, yeah. 40 minutes! I thought this was going to be a short episode! Ah! Okay, um, I'm still working on my socks for my mama. Those will probably be done next time because her birthday's coming up. She's a Gemini! Um, so, the last thing I'll show you, I will just show you briefly, um, I will is my... Oh, Bentley sweater, right? Is that it? Is that right? Bentley? Bentley sweater by Marie Green. And it is knit with Susan B. Anderson's 
beautiful yarn. So Barrett Wool Company's um, Wisconsin Woolen. And I totally made it to the ribbing, people. What? So there's my armhole. There's the front with the cute little texture. Can you see it? Maybe. Yeah, you can kind of see it. And so now I'm on to the ribbing. I just started. Boink. By the way, do you see my stupid secret stitch marker? That's a s'more. It's a s'more, people. Well, my progress reminder or whatever thing. Yeah. So the pattern is written um, like as a cropped sweater, but I have quite a few cropped sweaters. So I wanted to make mine longer. So um, mine is actually, my favorite jackety things are 18 inches long. And there's three inches ribbing on this pattern. So I'm making the sweater 14 inches long, the ribbing three inches long, and it'll probably grow an inch or so with blocking. It may even grow a little bit more than that. So. Hmm. It's very enjoyable. But no more fingering weight sweaters, not in the round for a while. This is pearl back rose, y'all. It's real. That's my pat my bag from Knitsman Farm. Kapow. By the way, I was totally working on this sweater, the slipper last time, and it was in this bag that I showed you, but I forgot to show you what was in the bag, so I didn't finish those and start those within two weeks, so I just finished them. Oh, and then really quick, I do have a sewing finished object. Remember when I was all about this, this fabric? Oh my gosh, right. Ah, it's designed by Ray Ritchie which is R-A-E, and her last name is Richie, R-I-T-C-H-I-E. By the way, I didn't even realize last week, I had bought that skep fabric quite a bit, the beehives. I bought that skep fabric like 18 months ago, a year ago, something like that. And then I decided to pair it with this fabric, which just came out, uh, and an update, and they're totally designed by her too. How fun is that? I have this weird thing where I like my updates to kind of go it's a weird thing. <laughs> but so anyway, so you see this? Do you know what this is? It's Annie and Olive's crate cover for their dog crate. What? So I have an excuse to have this fabric in my house. Yay. So I'm very excited about that. So yeah, I just, oh, and by the way, look at the interior. I totally dig it too. Right? Mm, totally want to make a girl out of that. But so yeah, I just made, basically I just made a panel that was like the top and back of the cage. And then I just put a piece of um, iron on quilt batting. I can't quilt things. Like I've tried so many times. I am just, I just am not in a place right now where I have the patience for it. Um, so I made a panel that was the top and the back. And then basically I just sewed it inside out, turned it inside out, did like a top stitching around the edge, and then did the same thing for a, a side panel and a side panel. <laughs> so they were finished basically, like I have like three finished rectangles. And then I just sewed them, I'm so sketchy, but whatever looks cute is fine. And then I totally just sewed them together, like on the right side, I just put them together, clipped them, and just sewed them together. Totally functional. Works. Annie and all don't care. And I get to look at the fabric. Yay! There's a Tim Gun make it work moment, people. It's very exciting. Did I say trapezoid earlier? That's what it is. What did I say? Tetrahedron? Whatever, I'm a nightmare. Anyway. So the rest of the show is totally shameless self-promotion. If it's the future, I'll see you next time. If it's the present, and you want to stick around, if you don't, that's cool too, man. I understand. Dollars are real. Um, I will show you the prizes next time. I'm working on them, but I don't have them done yet. I'm doing napkins this time. Will that be fun? I don't know. We'll see. I like them. They have bees on them. So anyway, this week's, this time's shameless self-promotion. There will be a shop update May 12th at 9 p.m. That's the Friday before Mother's Day in the U.S. And so it's like a treat yourself update. Treat yourself. So these are all the things. It has every single bag size I make in it. So something for everybody. 
as long as you like a flower. If you don't like a flower, see you next time. Here we go. So we have sock bags and these like sweet watercolory. This one has a green lining. No, this one has a lining that's like this bluish color and this one has a green lining. Sock plus size. I feel like I'm doing something, but I don't know what it is. I'm just gonna show it to you closer. What? Right? Where is my breezeway and my collection of vintage glass wear? What? Just forget for a minute that those peonies have a million ants on them. Just forget for a minute. <laughs> so this is available in sock plus and in my small wedge size. So you can see that here. And then, oh, there's a blue colorway too. Also available in sock plus and small wedge. It's getting really warm, the heater just kicked on. If it were up to me, the heat would not be on. Compromise. Hmm. So this is the large wedge size, right? Oh. I really love how she did these. It's a little Bob Ross. It's not a little. I mean, like, I mean that in the most beautiful way. Like, I'm like, I see her with her palette knife making these tree branches. It makes me happy. And then there's also a purple colorway. So again, that's the small, the large wedge size. Excuse me. Here's a sweater one. This is my favorite. I really love this one. It's grayish and orange. So that's in the sweater size. And then the alternate colorway is this beautiful green and purple. Again, with your breezeway, come on. What? You need that. And then in the Aaron sweater, which is like the most ginormous bag in the universe. <laughs> so you have to back up for this one. the most this has very beautiful yellows do you see this like beautiful buttery it's just butter right mm, so buttery and this like blushy blush this is actually it's sh maybe sh reading a little whiter but it's actually just like the blushiest little or this amazing yellow right it is like both mustard it's like, how can it be mustard, but then also go with this aqua color? I don't understand. But it's amazing! So, I think that's all for this week. Oh my lord. I'm so thank you. It's gonna be a short episode. Anyway, I hope you have a great week, a super happy, awesome ladies' day! And I'll talk to you next time. Bye!